And joining me now from Capitol Hill, Congressman Ed Royce, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. I wanted to ask you about Iran's new proposed uh, ambassador to the United Nations, Hamid Abdullayeb. He is reportedly someone who was involved in the embassy takeover back in 1979. He and the Iranians say that he one of the hostage takers that he was brought in afterwards as a translator. But the U.S. government has to decide whether to visa him. It's under some restrictions, I understand, under U.N. mandates as the host country. We don't have a whole lot of leverage. At least the State Department says it doesn't. What would you like to see happen with this new ambassador from Iran? Well, I, I suspect that what Iran is doing is trying to uh, push the envelope to see how far they can push the United States. One of the things that we've monitored are the increases in executions inside the, the inside Iran where a lot of the uh, religious leaders that don't follow the Ayatollah's beliefs are being taken out and executed and, and others other opposition figures are being killed and so this might be also an attempt just to see if we react to this now so far the added executions inside Iran since Rouhani became president hasn't generated uh, much reaction from the United States. So I would say now would be a time to push back and show them that um, they're not going to be able to run the tables uh, on, on the U.S. And, and clearly they communicate, you know, to their supporters. Uh, th this incident of the hostage, hostage taking had a lot of relevance inside Iran to the Iranian revolution, just as it did to the United States here. Uh, we have strong passions about that as well, so symbolically it's important to them to see if they can get away with this. I suggest we don't let them. So the State Department should not grant that visa as far as you're concerned? Well, well no, because under the State Department rules, we're allowed to withhold the granting of a visa if, it, if, if there's a security component to it. And the fact that this individual was involved in taking American hostages would allow us to use that rationale. So yes, we should exercise that. Now, I know you're going to be going to Ukraine in the next couple of weeks. Uh, yes. What do you, what is your assessment right now of what Russia is doing? Because they pull back some units, but according to your colleagues whom I've spoken to, the indications are that the, the main uh, groups of, of troops there on the border are still there and still threatening to Ukraine, and that Putin and Russia are, are doing other things to severely pressure the Kiev government. They are, and at the same time, we're doing some, taking some steps that would severely pressure Russia's uh, long-term interests. You know, Russia, 70% of their exports are oil and gas. And so, because of their monopoly situation in Eastern Europe, they're able to charge so much money that the profits go right to the bottom line. 52% of the budget of the Russian military and government come directly from uh, sale of oil and gas. One of the things we're going to be talking to the government of Ukraine about uh, is the ability of Ukraine now to extract gas and to use that gas. This week it was reported that the Russians are going to increase the price of Ukrainian gas by 44 percent. Well, here's an opportunity sort of long term to work with the Ukrainians and frankly if we can take some of our gas which we're flaring, we're capping wells here because we have a glut on our market. If we ship, ship that to Poland, to, to uh, Hungary and other Eastern Europe, and Ukraine and other Eastern European countries, that helps break the Russian monopoly on gas there. And that's important to us because uh, this will help our budget. It will compound their budget deficits. We should be exporting. Now, right now, Secretary Kerry is going from Algeria to Morocco, and we've seen the Middle East peace talks pretty much break apart. They've been underway for eight months. Both sides, according to Secretary Kerry, have shown bad faith in the last 24, 48 hours. What should he do, and should he even put uh, Jonathan Pollard's earlier release on the table to try to bring them back together, if that you, would work? You know what I think would work best? would be an overture directly to President Abbas about a subject that I've talked to President Abbas about himself. If President Abbas would agree to not use the language of incitement, which he has in some of his broadcasts, and which the Palestinian Authority does in broadcasting into the, into the country, and instead prepare the Palestinian people for peace, for negotiations leading to peace, by changing that, that rhetoric, 
to actually explain a dynamic where in the future, you know, uh, Israelis, Jews, and the Arabs can live together, can work together. If, if they just drop the incitement language, I think that alone would be an indication uh, to um, Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and to Israel that there's going to be a change in tone, a change in attitude. If, if that commitment was made by President Abbas, I do think it, it could be a game changer in the region. But as long as the, as the rhetoric on the broadcasts out of the Palestinian Authority marginalize and demean the Jewish people, I, I think you know, obviously there's going to be reticence. I, I think that that's an agreement that Abbas could make, and President Abbas should do exactly that right now to get things back on track. Thank you very much, Chairman Royce.